Today we're gonna to talk about building a life on what really matters. Stick around. One of the big byproducts of living in the COVID era has been the craziness of the housing market in our world. Home values have gone through, uh, they've gone through the roof, right? Which is good and it's not so good. It's good if you have a house and you can sit on it and watch the value go up. It's bad if you're trying to buy a house or rent something and you feel like I am getting priced out of this market. I can't afford anything. So it cuts both ways. Some of you are remodeling, some of you are downsizing, some of you are upsizing, some of you are tearing houses down or building them up. Some of you want to sell and you want to cash out, but you don't know what you would buy if you did. Uh, I feel like I'm in and around these conversations all of the time. Jesus makes a point that your life is like a house and your faith is like what you build that house upon, that it can be shaky or it can be solid. And as we dig into this passage in the book of Colossians chapter three today in this series that we've called Life Under Pressure, I think there is a lot to this idea that, that building a solid house and building a solid faith aren't that different from each other. So we're in the middle of a few home renovations and remodeling in my house, but a bunch of years ago, probably 15 years ago, we had these green laminate countertops that we started to really not like for obvious reasons, like they were a really bad shade of green. And at the time we really couldn't afford to replace them fully. And so we had somebody come in and literally replace the laminate on them, which this is a little strip of that. The, the laminate is a thin veneer that gets glued onto the top of the board underneath. And it was amazing. They looked great. Like completely changed the look of the countertops and of the kitchen. But I always knew that underneath that old laminate, like the old laminate was there underneath the new and the old boards were there right below the surface. Now, sometimes that's how we think about Christianity. It's like an add on. It's an addition to our already okay life. It's like a veneer on top that we add on, on top of our old self, like a, like a fresh coat of paint on an old wall. But our fresh coat of paint or the laminate we add on top of the old countertop might be, hey, I'm gonna start going to church or I'm gonna apply these principles to my life or it's all about serving others so I'm gonna serve people around me, which are all great things. Those are all great things. There's nothing wrong with any of those things, but you can do those things and never address what's underneath. Jesus came for all of you. Christianity, it's not a behavior modification strategy. It is not just to get you to behave. It's about rooting out the deepest and darkest places in our lives and addressing the real issue. It would be like if you had termites in some wood under your house and you just decided, well, you know, it's, it's like too hard to get to those bugs and I really don't wanna go to the trouble of replacing all of those boards, so let's do this. Like, let's just cover it up with maybe a little bit of wood putty, let's repaint the wood and then we will just call it a day. You could probably make that look really good and it would look great for a while until those bugs decided to keep on chewing that wood and pretty soon you'd be right back where you started and probably even worse off. My friend Scott, who is a great home craftsman, has been painting the inside of my house and there was this crack over one of the doorways in my house that he pointed out. And while most painters probably would have just patched it and painted it and moved on, he said, if I do that, it's just gonna happen again because there's a problem, there's a reason that crack showed up and it has to do with what's going on underneath the house. And so he went down below and he found some, some sagging going on in the joists and he jacked them up with a jack and he bolstered that area with a new support structure. He took the time and did the hard work to fix the root of the problem. If this faith is about anything, it's about addressing the root of our problem. If Jesus wanted to accomplish anything, it was to address the root of our issue, the root of our problem. He didn't just come to our house 
And when we invited him in, he, he just came over to paint a crack or to patch it or replace the laminate or putty over some termites. No, he came with, and, and let me say this as lovingly as I can, because that's what this is. It's out of love. He comes with a wrecking ball. And he says, I believe we have some foundational work to do. Your life isn't a series of minor home improvement projects designed to give a more cosmetic appearance and better curb appeal. Jesus wants to do a major rebuild. And when you let Jesus in, it is demo day, baby. Like it's demo down to the foundation and below. That's different. It's the difference between taking up the sledgehammer in your own hands or, or handing that sledgehammer over to Jesus and saying, you go for it. Like this is a job that only you can handle. And, and, and when you do, Though, when you do that, when we invite him in at that level, it's then and only then that our lives can start to change. That real transformation from the inside out begins to happen. Now, one of the things that Paul, who wrote the book of Colossians, is doing when he writes this is to help us see what that kind of life looks like. Last week in chapter two, we talked about how he was saying, you have a new foundation now. You're, you're built on the rock of Jesus himself. You don't live anymore like the rest of the world does. You have the potential for a new, better, transformed way of living. And this week, as we dig into chapter three, he's answering this question. What does a life built upon Jesus look like? How's it different? It turns out that your life isn't just different on the outside, but that change, that difference starts on the inside. So here's how Paul starts with chapter three of the book of Colossians. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You not only died with Christ, you have been raised with Christ. This is why he came, why he was resurrected, so that you could be raised with Christ. Him. And it means that God sees you just as he sees Jesus. Crazy, right? You're seated at God's right hand with Jesus. He's saying, this is a thing that's, that's kind of hidden right now. It hasn't been fully revealed. You're still here. You're a resident of the United States, of North Carolina, of Cornelius or Mooresville or Huntersville or Davidson or Charlotte. And, and that's what everybody sees. But the reality, which for the time being is hidden, he says, is that you are a resident of heaven with Jesus now. That you are his brother that you're his sister, that you are a child of God with infinite worth, that, that when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin any longer. He sees Jesus standing in for you. And he says, because of that, you can set your heart, your, your mind on things above, which means basically shifting from asking yourself this question, what do I want? Like, what do I want? To asking yourself a new question. And this new question is completely different than that old question because the new question takes things out of my hands and puts them into God's. The new question is this, what does God want? Not what do I want, what does God want? Like this is a major, major shift. It's a foundational shift. It isn't just a cosmetic change. It's a change at the very core of who we are and Jesus makes it possible. What does a life built upon Jesus look like? First of all, it means we ask a new question, what does God want? Not what does I want, what does God want? And one of the answers to that question is, is that what we do here on earth, how we treat each other, how we treat ourselves matters. We can't get around that or escape it. Paul says it very directly in the next verse here. In verse five, he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have been taken off, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So, so, so since Jesus has built your life on a, on a new foundation, 
That should be reflected in how you treat others and how you treat yourself. Morality actually matters. Following God's best for your life matters and his commandments are always for our benefit. When God prohibits something, he always, always has your best and my best in mind. Paul gives us a little list here, like a little, a little sin sampler with several of these sexual in nature and it's because he saw that in that day and it's true in ours that sexual sin can get out of control and that's because sex is a powerful thing. And, used in the proper way, the way that God intended it, it's a wonderful gift within the context of a marriage relationship. And, and if you feel when I say that, that that requirement is just some arbitrary, archaic thing, it's not. The reason he tells us that we should limit sex to the confines of a marriage is that it's the only type of relationship that can actually handle it. The commitment that it takes to handle a sexual relationship in a healthy way is only found in a marital commitment. He, he adds to that list, greed, anger, rage, malice, slander, bad language, and lying. All these things are the ways of the old life. It's time to take that off. He says it should be like uh, we take off a really old ratty jacket. Like have you ever had something on with a bunch of holes in it and everybody around you hates it except for you. And it's like finally taking off that old drafty jacket for something that fits better now. He says you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. It's time to step into this new life, but it won't just happen. He says in the power of Christ, you have the ability to now walk in a new way with a new foundation into a new life. And you don't have to be tied down to the old, dark, sinful ways of doing things anymore, that there's a better life for you. What does a life built upon Jesus look like? Well, a life that is growing in goodness. And these things, Let's face it, those th things on that list are hard to overcome and some of them are habits that are ingrained within us. They're things that we are used to, have become even comfortable for us and the truth is this. The only way you're getting out of those things is through Jesus himself. You're not strong enough to break those habits, but he is. And his goal is to create a stronger you, and a, and a part of that is treating others around you better and treating yourself better. God has his best for you and he wants you to realize that in your own life. And there's one more thing in our passage that he says is critical if we want to build a life upon Jesus as our foundation and it will require a shift in the way that we think about not only Jesus but one another. We, we put up fences around our houses. You see like fences that, that keep certain people out and others in. People who aren't like us, who don't look like us, talk like us, or speak the same language as us, They're, or even are on the same socioeconomic plane as us, or what, whatever. We build these fences. Building these fences between us and others is totally anti-gospel, anti-Christian, and anti-Jesus. Here's how Paul says it. He says, here, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And a life that's built on Jesus recognizes that we have to start asking a new question. What does God want? A life that's built on Jesus is a life that grows in goodness. And then a life that's built upon Jesus believes that the ground is truly level at the foot of the cross. That there's no difference when it comes to Jesus. It doesn't matter what color your skin is or how much money you have or where you're, you, you live or what language you speak or what your family history or religious heritage is. Do you know Jesus? Then you're my brother. Do you know Jesus? Then you are my sister. We're family because we all relate to God the same way. I know Jesus. He's become my father. Therefore, we are brothers and sisters together, whoever you are. What does a life built upon Jesus look like? A belief that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so let me just take a few minutes and remind you what the gospel is like, like what it looks like at the foot of the cross, what it means to be a Christian. And the main point in all of this is to build your life on what matters. So if I was sitting down across the table from you at a coffee shop and we were talking about this, I might take out a napkin and, and kind of draw it out like this. I would say, okay, um, what does it look like in your life and even when you think about what happens when you die, do you believe that you are going to be with God in the end? And a lot of times people will say something like this. They'll say, well, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I will, and I'll ask, well, what makes you think that? And, and they'll say something like, well, I, I've, I've done a pretty good job. Like, I'm a pretty good person. And, and maybe I would even ask, well, on a scale of one to 10, you know, what, what, where would you put yourself in there? And everybody typically is, is wanting to be humble. And so they might say, well, I might be a six or a seven. And, and, and so to clarify that, it, it basically means, well, if you're, if you're talking about better than, say, what, like better than Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler, or but not as good as like Mother Teresa or the Pope, you know, somewhere in there. And, and uh, they might say, well, yeah, I'd put myself there. And, and then often what I will do, what I've done in the past is, is draw out on this napkin. Here's what the Bible says about this, that you and me, like we're over, we're over here, and I can even draw this out with some great artwork right here. We're over here, but God is over here. And there's this great chasm, this canyon in between us, this grand canyon. And, and in the book of Isaiah, it says that, that our sin has separated us so far from God that there's an eternal chasm between him and you, between him and me. Now, um, you can talk about things like this, like in Romans 3, 23, it says that um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It kind of backs this up. We've all sinned and fallen short. And then in Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death. Okay, so there's death. And then there's also judgment. The Bible says, hey, there's gonna come a point, like it says, all men are appointed to, to die, all people are appointed to die, and then judgment. That, that that is happening for us as well. Now, you also will be able to have this conversation too, like when people will say, hey, um, I'm trying to get across this myself with the good things that I do. Like I, I'm serving other people, I'm being kind to my family, I'm treating people well, and all of those things are great, but they simply aren't enough to bridge this gap. And one way of looking at it is, is this, if we were to all line up on the coast of North Carolina and I were to say, all right, we're all gonna try to swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Let me know when you get to Africa, the west coast of Africa first. Now, some of you are great swimmers and you're better than me and you would be able to get there, get, get a lot farther than I would. But none of us are gonna make it all the way across, are we? We need help, we need something else. In and of itself, that's terrible news for us. The good news, which is what the gospel means, the word gospel means good news. The good news, the great news is this. In the book of John, Jesus says, whoever hears and believes will receive eternal life and be free from judgment. Whoever hears and believes. I'm writing that word down, hear and believe, right? It also says in the book of Ephesians, it says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God so that no one should boast. So that's like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says it's by grace, it's not by works that you have been saved. So there's this chasm, and because of God's great love for us, even though he's a just God, he's also an incredibly loving God. And so to bridge that gap came Jesus. And that cross functions like a bridge for you and for me. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says that God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so the invitation for you is to do those two things, to hear and to believe. So today, you've heard this, but that only brings you like halfway. It's also about believing. And when you say, yes, I believe that he has done this for me, that brings you right over to this side with God. Not because of something that you did, 
but because of everything that Jesus has done. What are you going to build your life upon? What is the foundation that you are building your life upon? Is it sort of on you and up to your good works and your ability to reach across this gap yourself? Or have you said, no, I I hear and I believe that Jesus is the only one who could bridge that gap for me. That's the gospel. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to trust that he has done what I can not. And the invitation for you today is to turn your heart and your life over to him and to say, I'm coming across this, not on my own power, but because of you, Jesus. I'm saying yes to you. Let's pray. Father, um, even as I've walked through this many times, it's so powerful to sit and to, to even see it on a whiteboard and to recognize that that is reality. Just because I may believe all kinds of things doesn't necessarily make them true, but your reality is this, that uh, you have come so that we might have life. And you've offered that to us as a free gift to those of us who surrender ourselves to you and say, yes, I want you to live with me and in me and through me because I cannot do it on my own. That is the reality. And you invite us to build our lives upon that foundation. And if that demands that there's a wrecking ball that's brought to the base of our our house that we're building so that you can start over and fresh, then bring that on, Lord. I pray this in the mighty, amazing name of Jesus. Amen. In Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, He tells us that we are his masterpiece, that we are created anew in Christ, um, and that he has a plan for each one of us. Um, So, you know, just keep in mind and remember that you are individually a masterpiece that he himself has created and that he has a purpose and a plan for you.
Ryan, thanks for joining us today. I have a question for you. What is your next step? Is it going to lovelkn.org and finding information about our crews, which are our small groups? We have a crew just for you. We even have one that does everything online. Or perhaps it's uh, giving. Maybe that's the next step for you. We view giving as an act of worship. It supports everything we do at Love Lake Norman. And you can find more information on our website, lovelkn.org. Lastly, maybe it's coming to see us here in person at the Oak Street Mill every Sunday at 9 and 1030. We would love to have you join us. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.